clear skies over the Pilansberg, with the Sun City Resort set to host the Sun City 400, an event that marked the halfway mark in this year's ABSA Off-Road Championship. With valuable championship points on offer, the top crews in the country converged on Sun City for what is always one of the most popular events on the off-road calendar. Audrey, this is always a very popular event and it's uh, quite a tough test, quite technical, but I believe you've made some quite significant changes to the route. We had to, uh, for, the new act for the activities at the mines at the moment, we had to change it and the people got used to the route as we had it for the past three years and we tried to make it more technical. I've got a, I would say, I guess, uh, 35 kilometers of virgin terrain that's never been ridden before, even in the old days, and it's technical and it's rough. The people are going to wake up and I think what we did now is to, for the spectators, we created more. We're running kilometers next to tar roads and dirt roads. And it's a 35 kilometer loop for the uh, spectators to follow the whole event, which I think it's going to be uh, a plus for the spectators. And they can sit there in a three lap event, they can actually pick a tree and sit and watch the whole event. As always, there was last minute attention to detail. While on the production vehicle championship front, veterans Hannes Hrobler and Francois Jordan went to Sun City with a comfortable points advantage at the top of the leaderboard. Behind them, just 10 points separated the next six crews, with a scene set for some hugely competitive racing. With Class T for super trucks being phased out of South African off-road racing, top Ford factory crew Neil Woolridge and Kenny Schulthammer were missing from the Sun City race. Seen here in action in the Nissan Sugar Belt early in the season, Woolridge and Schulthammer will rejoin the fray when the new super production class makes its debut later in the year. Toyota 1000 Desert Race winners Alfie Cox and Ralph Pitchford in the proudly South African Nissan Hardbody were among the crews fancied for an overall win, with the former motorcycle stars taking to racing on four wheels like a duck to water. Yeah, look, you know, the Desert Race, it's a fantastic race to win, and I mean, especially have won there before on a motorcycle, and you know, you don't think about, did you win, who's won it on a bike, or who's won it on a car before, and yeah, it's a special race, it always has been, and you know, it, 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 there was a little bit less pressure, from, you know, because Hannes had that problem, but, but he was chasing every single day, and we just kept our head down and kept a good pace, so the Desert Race, to be honest, I'm still smiling from it, and uh, ready to go back in the pickup again, you know, it's one of those things that you just can't wait to, to go back and race. Also part of the Class D mix with high expectations at Sun City were Kutsia Labiskachny and Johan Gerber in the race Sonics Nissan hardbody. At this stage we're under pressure to just have a finish and a good finish as that. Um, so we'll push today, we want a good starting position for tomorrow and uh, then we'll have to finish this race. With our new sponsors this year with race Sonics, Zwane, Kodak and with the support of Nissan we need to bring the points home now. Manfred Schroeder and Alec Harris, Ford Racing Ranger, who won twice early in the season, had a wretched time on the Toyota 1000 Desert Race and were looking to bounce back at Sun City. Now, there's only three points in it. Um, you know, the first two races we won our class. Um, Desert Race, we were disappointed not to have finished. Um, we're doing very well, and unfortunately, the electrode and the spark plug broke off and it damaged the piston, so we were out. Um, we sorted that out, uh, put another piston in and um, did a couple more mods to the motor. It seems to be going even better than it has before. Yeah, and it's come to this event, um, the last three years, we haven't finished it. So hopefully those were our three bad ones. Um, we've had our bad ones behind us and definitely looking forward to a class win. And that's what we're going to aim for. The Castrol Toyota team was well represented in Class D at Sun City and had high hopes for talented brothers Mark and Gavin Cronier. I've had a terrible time starting out in the Sugar Belt. Uh, we had a, a DNF in the Sugar Belt with some steering problems. Um, the team worked really hard and got that rectified and we went out to, to, to Cape Town and had a good result, finishing second in class and I think it was fourth overall. But um, I think the most important thing there is that we realised how badly, sort of pace-wise, we needed to pick up our game. We went back and really put in a lot of effort to try and get the vehicle up and getting it going a little bit quicker, going to, to, to the, the desert. It clearly showed that it had a lot more pace. Um, the guys did a tremendous job on the car. Unfortunately, due to circumstances, we had a, a gearbox fail on us, totally off the cuff. Something's never happened to us before in that specific side of the box. So we've rectified that now, and we've, yeah, at Sun City today, and um, we're hoping that in terms of the pace we have, 
we'll be able to keep it up front. We know the terrain is very, very tough. Well, my original strategy was to um, get points up until the new super production class starts, and the only way you're going to get points is to finish every race. And uh, we've done that so far, and, and uh, surprisingly, it's put us second overall in the championship, which leading into super production, Hannes first, myself second, um, puts us in a strong position for the end of the year. Paolo Piazzamoso has raced karts, is a former rally champion, and is also a part of the powerful Castrol Toyota lineup. Well, our tactics always to go first and foremost for a finish. Um, obviously, we all strive to go into the podium. Uh, that's really what we're going to push for. Um, this is a very tricky event. Uh, it seems deceptively fast and nice, but actually underneath it's uh, quite uh, rough. Um, it's quite hard on the vehicles. We saw it last year. Um, but uh, I'm hoping that we have some success and some luck this time, that the Hilux stays together so that we can have a good, uh, good finishing record, you know? KwaZulu Natal crew Zane Pierce and Brian Martin arrived at Sun City with a 100% finish record this season and were looking for another clean run in their Castrol Toyota Hilux 2.7i. Yeah, we've uh, been very happy with the, the way the Toyota's performed this year. Uh, compared to last year, we're having a much better season. Uh, the idea is to finish the race. Uh, we've uh, taken a strategy to not run at uh, flat out pace. Uh, and normally end up breaking the car that way, so we run at about 85-90% of pace and it's proved successful so far this uh, year. Special Vehicle Championship leaders Atang Mahetaneni and Bux Carolyn were also missing from Sun City. They will race only in selected events, and among those hoping to take advantage of the situation were Class A frontrunners Gary Bertolt and Siegfried Rousseau in the Advansoft iBurst batch. Well, I've been coming to this event for many years. i uh, won the, my class on a motorcycle in this event and uh, won this event two years ago with Brandon Harkis. Tight, tough event, wonderfully organised, um, nice event to compete in. But as I say, I think the competition's tough. The track's usually well marked, so it should be a good day out there. Been in the front of, won the first event, had a good start. Been in the front of the other two events and unfortunately had a bit of bad luck. Certainly need to hold together, get some consistency in this event. Um, the competition is tough, but there have been two other winners on the other events. So the championship is wide open at this stage. But I think that from now on, we need to get the consistency and get this lovely iBurst advance off bat home. The absence of Mekhechaneni and Carolyn from the Sun City 400 also left the door open for Terence Marsh and Michael Whitehouse, lying second in the championship, to pick up valuable points in the Nashua Mobile Bat. Yeah, to date, as we go into the fourth event of the, the season, we two points off the pace. Uh, I think it's got a lot to do with uh, finishing two of the three events, and, and the finishing the event seems to be harder to do than anything else at this stage. Uh, three different uh, winners in three different uh, events also makes it the championship wide open. So, uh, yeah, taking that into account, we are obviously looking for another finish, and, and hopefully a good finish on top of that to, again, consolidate our position. With regular driver Mark Corbett away on an overseas business trip, co-driver Jean Moore found himself in the hot seat in the Century Property Developments bat. Yes, I'm driving this time um, in the Century bat, and um, although we um, didn't compete in two races for reasons, but uh, we still have a chance. Uh, there's still some light in the end of the tunnel because uh, there's still various winners for the previous event. Class B in the special vehicle category is highly competitive this season, with some intense rivalry starting to develop. Among the fancied contenders in the motorite racing bat were former quad racer Evan Hutchinson and Trevor Ormerod. We've had a good season so far. You know, we started off very well. Um, uh, we had a few problems at the last race at the desert, unfortunately, uh, which has put us back in the point slightly. Um, we want to put that behind us. We've got the car, everything is sorted out now. Motorrides, with their continued support, um, have helped us get the car back on pace again. All the problems are sorted out, and we're looking for a now successful result today. Yeah, you know, I think from a co-driver's point of view, it's not just the navigation, it's also working very closely with the driver. We've got to make sure at all times that if we're getting into very fast areas and that, that I, that I talk a lot to Evan, that we're communicating a lot on what's happening around us. And basically, it's, it's just keeping control in the cockpit at all stages of the game. Um, it's just bringing us down to earth sometimes when it really does get quick and, and nippy out there. Off-road racing is not only for the young and exuberant. Multiple South African champion Richard Schilling these days relies a great deal on cunning and experience. Yes, we're leading the class, and I'm, I'm happy to see that uh, quite a few more people, I think there's seven guys competing in the class. 
Um, yeah, but uh, class is important, but where we come overall is uh, maybe more important to me. Having uh, achieved what I have, it's still it's nice to do well. Tell me something I've always wanted to know. How serious is the competition between the special vehicles and the production vehicles, although they actually aren't technically competing against each other? Uh, oh, very much so. Um, if I see a bucky, I've got to go to just that extra bit quicker. Because, uh, you know, yes, the T cars are very, very competitive. And I see some of these, um, I think it's called Class D, yes, Class D cars. They're quick, and I admire the guys that drive them, because, God, they get shaken around. But, serious competition uh, we might have a production and a specials championship for me i want to beat as many cars as i can the prologues run on the friday before every race always produce some interesting developments the prologues determine start positions for the race and also give drivers co-drivers and spectators a little taste of what they can expect when crews come out with all guns blazing the next day the proudly South African Nissan Hardbodies, built under the guidance of Nissan's motorsport manager, Glenn Hall, has dominated South African off-road racing in recent seasons. Reigning champions Hannes Krobler and Francois Jordan set the fastest time in the production vehicle category on the 45km prologue. Hot on their heels were teammates Alfie Cox and Ralph Pitchford, who ran into some early navigational problems. OK, half and left, coming up, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, is that it there? No, I think we missed it. Sorry. No, there's no market. We have to be sharp here. There. 790 right. Despite little hiccups, Cox and Pitchford were only two minutes behind Probler and Jordan to grab second place in the production vehicle category. On the special vehicle front, the ever-aggressive Gary Bertolt and Siegfried Rousseau were busy setting up the fastest prologue time for the fourth event in a row. Bertolt comes from a motor racing family and cut his off-road teeth navigating for Father Bodo. Brother Bevan was also in the Sun City field with a lot of friendly family rivalry floating around. The route was very tight and bumpy in sections, with crews having to mix caution with aggression. Caution is not normally a strong point where John Ware Smith and Jeff Minnett are concerned, but they brought the Coppenon Hotel Super Team Racing Jimco home in fourth place among the special vehicles. Former Class E champions Mark Cronier and Chris Birkin were also a little cautious in the Castrol Toyota Hilux running in Class D. They were around four minutes slower than pace setters Krobler and Jordan, but were fourth in the production vehicle category and ninth overall. Chasing the Toyota were Clint and Rob Gibson in the bat, eventually finishing seventh in the special vehicle category and tenth overall. Behind them, Gerard Duplessis in his first outing of the season and Ferdi Sierkers were on a charge in the Jimco and were to finish third overall and second among the special vehicles, just 38 seconds behind Berthold and Rousseau. Nick and Ryan Harper were another crew not taking too many chances on the prologue. Out in another bat entry running in Class A, the father and son team eventually finished 33rd overall and 21st in the special vehicle category. While the Harpers went on their merry way, things were not going too well for Class D frontrunners Manfred Schroeder and Alec Harris in the Ford Racing Ranger. The Ranger was carrying the scars of an encounter with a tree that left them with two-wheel drive only and dropped them down to 13th overall and 4th in the production vehicle category. Terence Marsh and Michael Whitehouse were on their way to a solid 5th in the special vehicle category in the Nashua Mobile Bat, with the Jimco driven by Will Battershill and Reg Sutton among the midfield runners. They had problems with one of the wetter sections of the prologue route, while behind them the father and son combination of Rob and Gareth Walk were making steady progress in the superpaved Chenoweth. The pair finished 30 seconds adrift of Marsh and Whitehouse. <laughs> Matters were going along smoothly for Class D Championship leaders Gavin Cronier and Robin Houghton. The Castrol Toyota Hilux crew were enjoying a clean run, but trouble was lurking. It was turning out to be a tough afternoon for Evan Hutchinson and 
Trevor Ormerod in the motorbike racing bat. They ran into power steering failure and that hindered their progress and dropped them down the special vehicle list. With former motorcycle racer Chris Davies sitting alongside Richard Schilling, there was an awful lot of experience cooped up in the Plastitech Aceco. The pair were having a good run and were the first of the Class S finishers and 11th overall. There were plenty of vantage points along the prologue route for spectators and photographers, with Jean Moore and Jason Brewer going along nicely in the Century Property Developments bat. There was also steady progress for Class D crew Arnold Duplessis and Johan Knox in the BP Auto Nissan Hardbody, with the pair having a clean run. Progress for top-class D contenders Gavin Cronier and Robin Houghton had come to an abrupt halt, with Toyota team members trying to make contact with team headquarters. Cronier and Houghton managed to deposit the Castrol Toyota Hilux 2.7i into a ditch and blew their hopes of a top starting position the next day. Kay and Caroline Huster were managing to maintain forward progress, but it was slow going after a puncture, but Cronier and Houghton would gladly have swapped places. Shamir Variawa and VZ Van Zale were another crew content to adopt a cautious approach on the prologue. Out in the total port of PR1, the pair were to end up in 8th place in Class A and 12th overall. While Variawa and Van Zale were cruising along, Kutsia Labeskachny and Johan Herber were another crew who looked to be making steady progress, only to run into late problems in the Raisonics Nissan hardbody. Mechanical problems dropped them way down the field and ruined their afternoon. Another crew to have their afternoon turn sour were Hein Mulman and Cecil Fincham in a Toyota Hilux. They were also to be classified among the prologue non-finishers and were faced with some overnight repair work. They had the frustration of seeing other cars whip past them. One of those was a top car racing Nissan hardbody in the hands of Dion Skullman and Jan Syme. A smooth run took them to third place in Class D and 14th overall. Chris Fisser and Jarpi Bardenhorst were the first Class E entry, around three minutes ahead of Hugo and Jarp de Brain with Hamish and Alistair Stubbs bringing their Viper home in second place in Class B, with Colin Matthews and Yanni Erasmus hot on their heels in the WPP Footloose. While Hannes Krobler and Francois Jordan set the fastest time, the prologue was dominated by special vehicle entries, which provided for seven of the top ten. Back at race headquarters at the Sun City Sports and Recreation Centre, it was time for drivers to reflect on the afternoon's work. The prologue was very, very difficult in the sense that um, it was difficult to find the markers. We found the distances not to be as accurate as we wanted them to be. Um, I mean, the first overshoot we had was already like uh, two k's into the event, so um, that just gave me a good understanding of, you know, to take a slight edge off and find the road. Um, which is basically what we did and just try to keep it on the road and got it to the, got it to the end. Apparently, but we'll, we'll wait and see now, we are first in class, so um, I'll be happy with that result. The car's gone, the best has gone this year. The only thing we had a problem with was the odors. We, uh, we actually forgot to do the one kilometre check uh, this morning and they didn't work from, from the word go. So that was the only thing, otherwise the car went perfect. We've checked the car now and nothing's wrong. So yeah, we're happy. For Shamir Variawa, getting to the Sun City 400 was a mad rush, and for reasons that have very little to do with motor racing, the opening day of the race was one that Shamir will not forget in a hurry. Well, uh, today was a good day for me. Uh, first of all, my wife gave birth at 10 o'clock this morning to a baby boy. Um, we got here, we had to take off uh, for the prologue at 3 o'clock, 3 or 2, and um, the only problem we had is we had to, we passed about eight guys in the time trial, in the prologue. And, um, I think that set us back on time, but uh, it's a rough course, it's very rough. Tomorrow the guys are going to have it hard, and um, but we got, I think we've got the right car for this type of terrain. The desert wasn't the right terrain for this car, but this is the right terrain. The prologue provided Bev and Bertolt with a setback, but the elder of the two racing brothers was prepared to look on the bright side of matters. We got a five minute penalty for uh, arriving late at the start, so we, we take that into account, which is, a, which is a hard thing to start a whole race of 400 k's with five minutes down. But um, it, was, it was very rough, which is good for my car. And, you know, over 400 k's, I must make some of that up. That, that, that's the way it's going to be. This outburst racing team is working well with my new with my navigator, you know. 
and I'm obviously very happy the whole sport, which is nice, which is also nice them coming on board. So um, I'm happy with that. When it comes to early morning starts, you can't beat off-road racing. And before sunup, technical crews were hard at work with final repairs and adjustments. For some, it had been a race against time to get their vehicles to the start line on schedule and in good working order. There was a winter early morning chill to proceedings with the pits a hive of activity as tensions built up before the race. For pre-race favourite, Hannah Scrobler, there was also the small matter of a potential problem. On Friday night, I think the flu catches up on me um, and we're not feeling too well, but uh, it went uh, well yesterday and uh, we did the fastest time on the prologue. So we're very, very happy with that because uh, the Sun City event is unbelievable dusty, you know, and if you're not there in the front, you can battle to keep with the front, guys. Despite the early morning chill, there was a fair crowd on hand at the start to see the cars flagged away in the order in which they finished the prologue. The head of crews lay around 400 kilometers of hard slog over a demanding route that would inevitably take its toll. Hannes Frobler and Francois Jordan in the proudly South African Nissan Hardbody got away ahead of three special vehicle entries, and the combination of early morning sun and dust was already proving to be a problem for fourth on the road Jean Moore and Jason Brewer in the Century Property Developments batch. Alfie Cox and Ralph Pitchford were the fifth car to be flagged away, and it didn't take them long to hurtle past John Moore and Jason Brewer, who had made an early stop to try and let the dust settle down. It was a problem that was to plague crews throughout the day. With no dust to hamper them at the front of the field, Krobler and Jordan set a cracking pace and were pulling away from the horde of Class A special vehicles behind them. Probler is to retire at the end of the year after an incredible career that has seen him win South African off-road, rally and track racing titles. And he was pushing hard to take advantage of the clear road ahead of him. Gary Bertolt and Siegfried Rousseau were leading the special vehicle attack in the Advansoft Eyeburst bat. At this stage, they were more interested in staying ahead of those doing the chasing than they were in making any sort of effort to catch the flying Probler and Jordan, who were disappearing into the distance. Third on the road and second in Class A at this early stage were Gerard Duplessis and Ferdi Sierges in the Jimco. The pair were having their first outing of the season and going along steadily. As well as they were going, there were problems looming for Duplessis and Sierges in the Jimco rapidly being hauled in by Alfie Cox and Ralph Pitchford in the second Nissan Hardbody. Cox, a South African motorsport legend via his exploits in off-road motorcycle racing, also had an incredible record on the ultra-tough Paris Dakar rally and is busy carving another niche for himself on four wheels with his win on the Toyota 1000 Desert Race, another milestone in a remarkable career. Behind Cox and Pitchford, the Century Property Developments bat in the hands of Jean Moore and Jason Brewer was coming under attack from John Weir Smith and Jeff Minnett in the Super Team Jimco. Not far behind them were Nissan Sugarbelt 400 winners Terence Marsh and Michael Whitehouse in the Nashua Mobile bat and hot on their heels were the father and son combination of Rob and Gareth Walk in the superpaved Genoeth. Chasing the four special vehicles ahead of them were Mark Cronier and Chris Birkin, who were third in the production vehicle category behind the two Nissan hard bodies. Yeah, right, three. 100 caution, rough ditches, you go over river. Mark Cronier is a former Rotex Max World Kart champion, and with the experienced Chris Birkin, he won the Class E championship in his first year in off-road racing. Cronier and Birkin were going along steadily and edging away from Clint and Rob Gibson, who started 14 seconds behind them in the bat. The Gibsons were starting to come under a little pressure from Class S leaders Richard Schilling and Chris Davies in the Plastitech Aceco, who were being chased by new father Shamir Variawa and VZ Benzel in the Total Porter. After their encounter with a tree on the prologue the previous day, Class D Championship contenders Manfred Schroeder and Alec Harris were adopting a more guarded approach during the early stages of the race. The factory entered Ford Ranger did not appear any the worse for wear after the tree incident, but the early morning sun and dust hovering from crews from up ahead were still causing drivers and co-drivers a few problems. 
Off-road racing is tough going and Manfred Schroeder was hard at work in what was going to be an uncomfortable and noisy office for the day. While trying to catch Class D leaders Mark Cronier and Chris Birkin, the Schroeder-Harris combination also had to keep an eye out for the challenge posed by Dion Skuman and Jan Syme in the top car Nissan. The Nissan started only 45 seconds behind the Ford crew and was going well in the early stages. Also going along steadily were Class E leaders Chris Fisser and Joppe Bardenhorst in the Toyota Hilux. Fisser and Bardenhorst started nine seconds behind reigning Class B champions Marcus Taylor and Mark de Chalene, but had moved ahead of the JRE crew. Also involved in the Class D battle were Arnold Duplessis and Johan Knox in the BB Auto Nissan Hardbody. They were going along steadily, but behind them a queue of special vehicles was lining up to attack. Leading the bunch were Hamish and Alistair Stubbs in a Viper, with Colin Matthews and Yanni Erasmus chasing them in the WPP Footloose. Right behind Matthews and Erasmus, and having to put up with plenty of dust, were John Thompson and Clinton McNamara in the Zarco Light with Hale Nell and Peter Newbury and keen to get among the Class B cars in the Class A Bozal Look 80E Zarco. Two other Class B entries, with Hendrik and Louis Ferry in another Zarco light, holding off the attentions of Bears and Etienne Bezetnote in the Adenko Sandmaster. A little further down the field, an interesting little Class D battle was starting to unfold between Nissan and Toyota entries. Yuri and Andre Duplessis started 18 seconds ahead of Paolo Piazzo Mosso and Aki Ferri in the Castrol Toyota Hilux 2.7i, with the two crews still separated only by seconds. Quickly closing in on the Nissan and the Toyotas was Evan Hutchison and Trevor Ormerod, who were on a charge after their prologue trials and tribulations. They had picked up more than a minute on the Nissan and the Toyota and were all set to pounce. Behind them was another tight battle going on with Nick Gosler and Jacques Robertson in the Copenhagen Hotel Super Team Racing Race Co, running in Class S, holding off David White in the Truggy Sandmaster. Perennial finishers Henry Zamatten and Bodo Schwegler were still going strong in the Mastercraft Rayobi Mitsubishi, but were being closed down by reigning Class E champions Hugo and Jaap de Brain in the Castrol Toyota Hilux 2.7i, running in Class E. They were, in turn, coming under a little pressure from Nick and Ryan Harper in the bat. Thomas Rundle and Stavros Yanakis in the Barden Tires Services Nissan were also involved in a little train of cars that were making for some interesting racing. The early morning sun was no longer a problem for crews, and it was just the dust thrown up by cars ahead that posed a few worries. Trailing the Class S leaders by a considerable margin were Archie Rutherford and Vincent Horn in a Sandmaster. They were making steady progress with Will Battershill and Reg Sutton chasing them in a Jimco. A three-car train was completed by Mark and Stuart Moffat in the Bozal Land Rover, competing in Class D in the production vehicle category. Helicopters heralded the whereabouts of the race leaders, and there had been plenty of drama. Early leaders Hannes Krobler and Francois Jordan lost half an hour when they broke a prop shaft, and Bevan Bertolt and Nick Salamalela in the Ibos bat had come storming through the field to make up 18 minutes and go into the lead. Bertolt was on a mission and had moved ahead of the Jimco of second place Gerard Duplessis and Ferdi Sierges. Duplessis and Sierges were battling to stay with the flying Bertolt and had the proudly South African Nissan hardbody of Alfie Cox and Ralph Pitchford chasing them. John Wearsmith and Jeff Minnett were still in touch with the leading bunch in the Copenhagen Hotel Super Team Jimco. Wearsmith and Minnett had moved ahead of early special vehicle leaders Gary Bertolt and Siegfried Rousseau, who'd lost around five minutes via a puncture. The route was starting to bare its teeth, and it was tough going in sections, with Bertolt and Rousseau starting to come under pressure from veteran Rob Walk and son Gareth in the superpaid Genoweth. A contest was developing between the Flyers and the Stayers, with Terence Marsh and Michael Whitehouse in the Nashua mobile bat ominously placed to take advantage of mistakes and misfortunes for crews ahead of them. Clint and Rob Gibson in another bat were also in the Class A mix among the special vehicles and were going along steadily without any fanfare or major dramas. 
Behind them, Shamir Variawa and VZ Vinzel were by no means out of the picture in the Turtle Porter, and the battle among the special vehicles was shaping up to provide more drama in the latter stages of the race. While the bunch of special vehicles were snapping at each other's heels, Mark Cronier and Chris Birkin had taken control of Class D and were lying second in the production vehicle category. The pair were having a clean run and had settled into a good rhythm. Behind the Castrol Toyota Hilux 2.7i, arch rivals Manfred Schroeder and Alec Harris in the Ford Ranger were going strong and appeared to have put their prologue problems behind them. Sections of the route were tight and rocky and it was tough going even with four-wheel drive fully operational. Veterans Richard Schilling and Chris Davies were having a good run in their Plastitec Ace Co and were leading Class S. The experienced pair were taking no chances and maintaining a steady pace. Arnold Duplessis and Johan Knox were giving their best performance to date in the BB Auto Nissan Hardbody and were lying second in Class D after making up two places since the start. Jean Moore and Jason Brewer, who had started fourth on the road and third among the special vehicles, found themselves back in 12th after losing 20 minutes with two punches. John Thompson and Clinton McNamara were leading Class B in the Zarco Light. Close behind them were reigning Class B champions Marcus Taylor and Mark Deschelaine in the JRE. Will Battershill and Reg Sutton in the Jimco were 14th overall and 7th in Class A. Top Car Magazine managing editor Dion Skuman and Jan Syn were having their best outing of the year in the Autopage DuPont Top Car Nissan Hardbody and were lying 19th overall and 5th in Class D. Hot on their heels and heading for third place in Class B at the end of the first lap was the motorite bat of Hutchison and Ormerod. Chris Fisser and Yapi Bardenhorst led Class E in the Tyco Trucks Toyota Hilux 2.7i, ahead of reigning champions Hugo and Yap de Brain in their Castrol Toyota Hilux. Brothers Yuri and Arnold Duplessis were pushing hard in the second BB Auto Nissan Hardbody and were just seconds behind the Toyota. Battling the dust in the hard, rocky tracks was the Advent Soft Eyeburst bat of Bevan Bertolt and Nick Salamalela, who were rapidly climbing up through the field from their lowly 44th starting position. Henry Zamatin and Bodo Zregler were maintaining their customary steady pace in the Mastercraft Ryobi Mitsubishi Pajero. Bears and Etienne Bezatnote were lying fifth in Class B in the Edenco Sandmaster. Trouble for the champions. Krobler and Jordan couldn't get their Nissan out of the deep Dongo without four-wheel drive. The Nissan stalled and the starter motor failed. While the other competitors passed the stranded pair, they sat making repairs. You have to be a technician as well as a driver to complete an off-road race. Yeah, yeah, this is not easy. We, we knew somewhere along the line with only front wheel drive, we're not gonna make it. And um, now the starter is also giving us a problem. God doesn't want to start, so we'll first see if we can get the starter going, and then hopefully we can try again, maybe get another route, whatever, up here. Gavin Cronier and Robin Houghton were 31st on the road after starting 45th and were having a trouble-free run, although they were frustrated by the dust. Rudy and Per van Kron were finding the going tough in the Class B Techno Chair Zarco Light. Off-road racing is a sport that brings out the best in people, and stopping to help a fellow competitor is not uncommon. 
Frobler and Jordan finally got going again after losing another 30 minutes. Take a rough ride with Kutsia Lapskachny and Johan Gerber in their race on its Nissan Hardbody. The Kopenong Hotel super team chef Silverado of Andre Boerter and Richard Carolyn was feeling its age, but still tackling the challenge of a tougher than usual Sun City 400. Labiskachny and Heber ran into problems with the rough and rocky conditions, which turned the race on its Nissan hardbody into a large mechanical crab. crossing under a bridge near the end of the lap was a popular gathering point for both spectators and photographers. Where Smith and Minnett were heading for second in the special vehicle category at the compulsory pit stop. On their heels were Duplessis and Sierthers in the Jimco. Gary Bertolt and Rousseau sailed through in the bat. Rob and Gareth Walk negotiate the water hazard safely in the superpaved Chenoweth, while the Nashua Mobile Bat Spec 1 of Marsh and Whitehouse is within striking distance. Close behind is the Gibson Plant Hire Bat of Clint and Rob Gibson. Shamir Variawa and VZ Vanzale give the total porter a self-service car wash on their way to eighth overall at the end of the first lap. Right three. There's another ditch over here as well. Somewhere. Schilling's Plastic Aceco has no problems negotiating the water crossing. Hard on their heels is the Class D Team Ford Racing Ranger of Schroeder and Harris, followed by Moore and Brewer in the Century Property Developments bat, making light of Axle Deep Water. Despite their problems, Krobler and Jordan stopped to assist a stranded special vehicle. Arnold Duplessis powers the BB Auto Nissan to 13th overall and third in Class D at the end of the first lap. Cox and Pitchford enter the pits fourth overall and first in the production vehicle class for the compulsory pit stop. You know, my, my pilot's really on form today. He's dialed in. Uh, the hardware is good. Uh, so today we're excited. Today we're going to do our sponsors good and... Uh, Kopenong Hotel and Conference Centre, today's their day and it's wonderful out there. We're having a great time with Gary and the diamond diggers and uh, very, very excited. This is, this is racing for a change. It was like a very rough and very technical, the dry keys were also long grass and mass genius. The rat grass is a bit for moeilijk. Routine maintenance for Cox's proudly South African Nissan Hardbody. We're just trying to maintain, but it's very rough out there, and it looks like the Sandmasters are really uh, showing what the suspension's like, you know, in, in this type of race. But we don't want to break the pickup. We need points. We need to finish. But uh, we're leading the pickup, so we just got to. You know, play for air. Whatever happens now, we I think we're fourth on the road, but very close. You know, within a minute, four guys. So yeah, we'll we'll see what happens on this next lap, and then obviously if we have to put pressure on the last lap. We will, but uh, we're conserving at the moment, and w we need a finish. The Cronje Perkin Toyota Hilux enters the service area first in Class D. Actually, going quite well. There's one or two places where we. Battle to find the route, but we didn't lose too much time. Uh, we've gained some time on the board, relying 
second overall amongst the Bucky, so at this point in time we, we're quite happy. It'll be easier um, on the second and the third lap, so we hope to keep it together. The Ford technicians are ready for Schroeder's Ranger, second in Class D. The super-paved Chenoweth exits the pits, fourth in Class A and fifth overall. Motorite MD Justin Cooper stands by with a fire extinguisher. It's tough, it's very tough. We start off in 30th position. The dust is incredible. There's no wind at all. The air is very still, so the dust is just setting. Very difficult to get past anybody. We've had a good run so far. Um, another two laps to go, and we've just got to keep it on the road without hitting anything. So uh, I'll be confident we'll take it to the end. Pit crews administer to their charges. We're battling in the dust for the first 50 case, and it makes a gap. And uh, then everything went well. We're battling with the marking. They are not quite up to standard, but finding the route, and everything is going well. We, I think we're leading the cars now, so... It's just what we planned, so hopefully we will continue this for the rest of the race. The Coppenon Hotel Super Team Jimco has taken the lead in the second lap and gets a little outside direction as it hurtles its way to the finish. Duplessis and Sierkes in the Porsche engine Jimco give chase behind the new leaders, showing no signs of throwing in the towel. Not far behind is a fast-charging Gary Bertolt, determined to make up for the lost time with his puncture. Oops, a slight misjudgment and a few more seconds are lost to the front runners. The glorious sound of the V6 engine Nissan Hard Body, charging hard and in full song. Cox and Pitchford are well on their way to their second successive production vehicle victory. Leader on the road, Weir Smith works hard at the wheel, and the Coppenong Hotel Jimco sounds healthy as he and Minute look good for their first win of the season. But trouble loomed ahead. <laughs> Duplessis and Sierkes weren't holding back and were waiting for the slightest mistake from the leaders. Cox is reveling in the power of the modified hard body and his enthusiasm shows as he gives it full rein. Marsh's safety first approach is paying off as he guides the big V8 engine Nashua Mobile Bat across the muddy tracks and through the water splash within striking distance of the leaders. Where Smith smells victory and is not holding back, the Jimco stretching its legs as it gets full rain. A full-blooded jump thrills the spectators. Duplessis' Jimco is sounding sick, and it looks like the battle for the first win of the season is over. Traffic jam in the felt. Cox makes quick work of a lapping back marker as Thierry Hick gives way in his single-seater race co. Marsh makes it look easy as he and the bat take a smooth racing line through a sandy S-bend among the northwest thorn trees. Not far behind is the bat of Moore and Brewer, putting in a great performance as first-time teammates, with Moore impressing in his unaccustomed role of driver, and the Jimco of Batters Hill and Sutton, having a steady run in their first season together in the ex-Nashua Racing Jimco. Cronier and Birkin are still leading Class D in the Castrol Toyota Hilux 2.7i. Nick and Ryan Harper's bat is having a clean run, although the pair have dropped back after making a few wrong turns. 
In the process of delivering the drive of the day, Hutchison, having started 30th overall and 7th in Class B, is now 11th overall and 2nd in Class B, despite having the power steering pump fail on the motor right bat. Hutchison is battling with the physical effort of steering without power assistance. Special vehicles have no windscreens, which makes splashing through mud puddles a messy business. The Walk Father and Son team demonstrate in their super paved general. Chilling and Davies' untroubled run in the Plastotec Ace Co and the smooth driving of the experienced former national off-road champion kept them in the lead in Class S. Duplessis and Knox were headed for their best ever result, the BB Auto Hardbody never missing a beat all day. Class B champions Taylor and De Chalane and their JRE were being closed down by the bat of Hutchison and Ormerod as the race entered its final stages. A steady drive by Skuman in the top car Nissan was to be rewarded with a first finish of the year and an excellent fourth overall and third in Class D in the production vehicle category. Archie Rutherford and Vincent Hall take a cautious line through the deep water on their way to a well-earned second place in Class S and tenth overall in the special vehicle category. The C brothers thoroughly enjoyed the event and were more than pleased to finish fourth in Class D and fifth overall. Despite suffering from a bad dose of flu, Frobler characteristically never gave up and was driving at full pace right to the end, finishing sixth overall after dropping back to 49th place at the end of lap one. Kronje and Birkin's fine effort was rewarded with first in Class D and second overall in the production vehicle category. First Class E production vehicle across the line was the Toyota Hilux of Chris Visser and Yapi Badenhorst. Thompson and McNamara were destined to finish third in Class B and 11th overall among the special vehicles. Former Class B champion, Hale Nell and Peter Newbury enjoyed their third point scoring race in a row in the Class A Bozal Look 80 in Zarco. Zamatin and Zwegler bought their Mitsubishi Pajero home for the 18th successive finish in a national championship off-road race. Despite a characteristically aggressive drive from their lowly starting position, Bevan Bertolt and Nick Salamonella were to retire on the lap three after getting stuck in a ditch for 30 minutes and then suffering steering belt problems. Surprise overall winners and first in the special vehicle category after 400 kilometers and nearly six hours hard driving were Gerard Duplessis and Ferdi Sierkes in the Jimco. Second overall and first production car home was the party South African Nissan hardbody of Alfie Cox and Ralph Pitchford, giving Nissan its fourth consecutive victory in the Sun City 400. The last two laps, it was a dirty rat floor, a rat court. And the rat and the car rat floor, it was a pop wheel of next year. The rock, the top of the rat stop, it was fast to go in. It was bad. Yeah, look, it's been a, a real day of controversy. I mean, we were we, we saw Hannes this morning after, you know, we left fourth on the road, or fifth on the road, and we got into fourth quite quickly. And then we saw Hannes parked under the bridge after about 15 kilometers, and obviously he had a problem, which put us in the front for the pickups. And, uh, you know, there were only, we've been battling with sand masters all day, so it's been up to second, I think, the one time, then back to fourth again. Then we had to come into the pits the last day. Left. We heard a bit of a noise coming from the, the rear of the pickup. We were just not worried that one of the suspension arms had broken. So we just checked it out. That lost us a little bit of time. But, you know, to win, to win the pickup class, I think, and second overall, we have to be happy with that. Two wins in a row. 
I'm sure that's what we just, just what we need. Marsh and Whitehouse were the second special vehicle home in the Nashua Mobile Bat, but followed closely by Moore and Brewer in the Century Property Developments Bat. They were later to be disqualified because Brewer was not wearing a helmet at one stage during the event. The unfortunate Weir Smith and Minute had to be content with third after losing the lead 20 kilometres from home, with a 27-minute stop to fix the fan belt pulley. Uh, hard work, uh, exceptionally hard work, uh, unbelievably uh, hard route. I think the attrition rate by the end of the day is going to be high, yeah. It really, really was tough. Uh, struggled the last, uh, last 30 k's, uh, struggled with a bit of uh, uh, fatigue, um, didn't have a good night's sleep, so struggled through. Got caught knitting a little bit to the odds of the end by Jean Weir, but uh, we pushed it home and got it, so uh, a hard day's work. Up front there most of the day today. We we did it start going wrong. Oh, just about 20 k's out. Uh, the pulley um, that holds the the one fan belt uh, broke, and as a result of that, we had no water pump. So we stopped and tried to use, try to make a Heath Robinson effort there to get it sorted out. We lost 27 minutes, so we lost a bit of time. A bit angry we were held up there in the last couple of minutes because we were coming in for a second. So. It was great fun. Uh, and you finished the race, which is important. For a change, yeah, can you believe it? <laughs> and you could have won it. <laughs> yeah, we could have, we should have. It's the, way, it's the way things are, it was a great race. Okay, well done. Thanks very much. Kronje and Birkin's Toyota Hilux was second production vehicle across the line and first in Class D. Oh, I an absolutely uh, thriller of a day. Um, the Bucky performed exceptionally well. The guys have done a great job on the vehicle. Um, we started out this morning um, in the dust and just sort of kept it clean, made sure that we didn't drive over anything and, and just pushed uh, once we got the, into the clear and we, we were about two minutes ahead of the Ford and we just kept that, that pace up and uh, all of a sudden we started opening up, opening up, but I don't know if the other guys got tired or, or if we just maintained a very good pace. First Class B vehicle was the motorite bat of Hutchison and Ormerod after a great drive. We, we had a the first lap it went very well. The car was running good. I think we went from seventh in our class and 30th overall up to second in our class. And just after we left the pits off, the uh, first pit stop, uh, we lost our power steering. And um, if you don't know what that is in a special vehicle, it's quite traumatic. It's very difficult. So we're a bit worried about it, but it would give us any further problems. But we, we just we, we thought we'd go as far as we could without power steering. And fortunately, it, went, it took us all the way home, and we've managed to come um, first in Class B and I think eighth overall. So, very, very happy about it. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Motorite and Justin over here, uh, for all the support they've given us since the last race, which was a bit of a disaster. But fortunately, we can give them a first place, and we're very happy to be able to do so. Thanks. Fisser and Badenhorst won Class E in the Tyco Trucks Toyota Hilux. Uh, yes, uh, today was a very, very tough race. We started out this morning first in class, and I, I thought, yes, maybe I'll just get, get like 10 to 5% pace the whole day. Um, and we kept the pace, and we kept the pace, and my navigator, you always said to me, no, yes, I think we're a little bit slow. I said, no, don't worry. I'll just, if we finish today, we'll be good. And uh, but the race, the, it was very tough. It was unbelievably tough. So uh, I'm saying it's the toughest of the event I've ever done in my life. So it was Cox and Pitchford taking the honours in the production vehicle category from Cronje and Birkin and Duplessis and Knox. Cronje and Birkin were first in Class D and Fisser and Badenhorst were the worthy victors in Class E. Duplessis and Siefers were somewhat surprised winners of the special vehicle category from Marsh and Whitehouse and the unlucky Wearsmith and Minute. Hutchison and Ormerod took the Class B honours and Schilling and Davies the Class S victory.